All right. So we don't have quite enough. I'm really pleased so many of you came. Cheryl told me you could make 60 copies. I guess we got to make a few more, so I'll go make some. You, hello. For those of you who've just arrived, there is some coffee, pink lemonade, and water over to your right, as well as hot tea for tea water. And um, somebody asked me for cookies, and I did put a tiny bit out, little tiny cookies. So um, thank you for being here. If you still haven't gotten a copy of the outline, please raise your hand. Whoa, more people came in. We had 20, then 25, now we got a, got a lot more. We can have to wait a couple of minutes. So we ran out of small pieces of paper. So you're gonna get a big piece of paper, but the advantage to that is you can put notes on if you want, if you brought a pen. And Ramiro is working feverishly, running back and forth with copies, so we'll get them. Pardon me? Thank you. Was there anybody here who was not at mass? Because I thought just there was something so funny that happened after the 8 o'clock mass that I told it to 12. 
I'll tell you again, just in case you weren't here. So at the 8 o'clock Mass, I was talking about Samuel and how God gave him wisdom, and he had all the right answers, but he didn't put them into practice. And so in the end, he was full of hot air. And after the 8 o'clock Mass, there was a lady that came up to me and said, you know, you do Jesus in Java, you let anybody ask any question they want, and you always seem to have an answer. And people say, you're so wise. But after hearing your homily today, I guess it just means you're full of hot air. <laughs> Everybody have one now? Okay, great. Let's start with a prayer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Heavenly Father, during this year of Eucharistic revival, we ask you to help us develop a greater appreciation, a greater hunger for the Eucharist. They say that familiarity breeds contempt, and we receive the Eucharist so often that it is easy to begin to be oblivious to the sacredness of what we are receiving. And so we pray that in this session and in all the days of this coming year, that little by little we will grow in appreciation and reverence for the great gift that your Son has given us in dying on the cross and granting us his body and blood. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Okay, so I've, it's not on your outline, but I realized after I made the outline just this morning that I really have to begin with just a little bit about baptism, because baptism is the prelude to Eucharist. Baptism, baptism is the first sacrament of initiation, and Eucharist is, is the second, and you can't receive Eucharist unless you've been baptized. So baptism is really the prelude to the Eucharist. So I want to tell you a little bit of a, little bit of a story about, I think, 12 years ago. I went on a wine tasting tour in Bordeaux, France. You know, it's, it's a tough life being a priest, I tell you. <laughs> and I always knew that the grapes were important, but I didn't know that the barrels were that important, but they really are. So I saw them make a barrel. They make these boards that are especially carved to be the shape of a barrel, and they make a big circle of these boards around a fire and the fire toasts the inside of those boards, and meanwhile they spray icy cold mist on the outside of those boards, and it causes them to warp. They bulge outwardly. And every once in a while they'll take them away from the fire and compare them to this one prototypical, prototypical board that has the perfect shape for a barrel to make sure that they line up with that perfect shape. And if it needs to curve more, they'll put them back on the fire. And little by little, between the fire and the water, they get that perfect curvature for a barrel. Now, this is a really important technology in the ancient world because you can't roll a box, can you? But you can roll a barrel. A raft is going to be overcome by waves, but a ship that has a curved hull will roll with the waves and will not sink. So this is an important technology. Now, if you go into a church in the ancient days, as in these days, and you're going to a baptism, what will you see? You'll see a baptismal font filled with water, and since the second century, you will see a paschal candle, fire. So just as it takes fire and water to warp the wood from a box into a barrel or from a raft into a hull, you've got fire and water at a baptism. And that is a sign that this is about formation. This is about molding and forming this child or this adult into the image of Christ. Because Christ is that prototypical board that is the perfect shape for a barrel. You go on your uh, word processor and you look under margins and you can find that you can justify the margins, which means they all line up properly, right? They're all a straight line. We hear in theology about justification and you think that's a highfalutin term, it just means lining up with Jesus, being the same shape, being the same formation as Jesus. So in baptism, we begin that justification process of being able to be a barrel. And why is it important that we're a barrel? A barrel holds wine. And in our case, as the church, this barrel holds consecrated wine, 
the blood of Christ. So it is by our baptism that we are able to embrace the consecrated elements. It is by our baptism that we become a Eucharistic people, that we become the mystical body of Christ. We become the barrel. We become someone shaped in the form of Jesus and able to hold that Eucharistic presence. So I've got a couple of quotes here I want to look at quickly, and then I'll tell you why I put them here. So the first one, as many of you were baptized into Christ, have clothed yourselves with Christ. There is no longer Jew or Greek. There is no longer slave or free. There is no longer male or female. For all of you are one in Christ Jesus. And if you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's offspring, heirs according to the promise. So there is neither slave nor free nor Jew nor Greek nor male nor female. What does that suggest to you? Put up your hand so I can, then I can hear you. We're all, the same. We're all the same, exactly. There's unity. So baptism brings unity. You know, we're a polarized society. We're a polarized world. And baptism enables us to be able to look at one another and say, you're not that different from me because we're all from the same God. We're created by the same God. We all have the same destiny to go back to God in heaven. Yes, there are things that are different about us, but the things that are the same are more important because they're cosmic, they're eternal. And so baptism reminds us and makes possible that unity, which we will see is part of the Eucharist as well. Second quote, just as the body is one and has many members, and all the members of the body, though many are one body, so it is with Christ. For in the one spirit, we are all baptized into one body, Jews or Greeks, slave or free, we were all made to drink of one spirit. Indeed, the body does not consist of one member, but of many. If the foot would say, because I am not a hand, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less part of the body. And if the ear would say, because I am not an eye, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would the hearing be? If the whole body were hearing, where would the sense of smell be? But as it is, God arranged the members in the body, each one of them as he chose. If all were a single member, where would the body be? As it is, there are many members, yet one body. The eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you, nor again the head to the feet, I have no need of you. So we have unity, but in that unity, we each have our own particular part. We each have our own mission. Uh, John Henry Cardinal Newman once said, God has given to me a mission which he has given to none other. If I don't do it, it won't get done but I shall do it. I will do it faithfully. And so each one of us has a particular vocation, a particular set of skills, a particular set of opportunities to fulfill God's kingdom on this world. We're all part of the same barrel, but we all have diversity. And that is part of the Eucharist also, the idea of unity and diversity in this dynamic, not tension, but dynamic union that helps us be ourselves but also be united with one another. And that makes us be able to help one another. It's collaboration more than competition. Last little quote. Christ the Lord, the high priest taken from among men, made the new people a kingdom of priests to God the Father. The baptized by regeneration and the anointing of the Holy Spirit are consecrated as a spiritual house and a holy priesthood, in order that through all these works, which are those of the Christian man, they may offer spiritual sacrifices and proclaim the power of him who has called them out of darkness into his marvelous light. So this, this spiritual house, I think of it as that barrel. You know, Christ has made us this spiritual house by baptism, this barrel that can roll along in our journey toward God, toward heaven, but on the way, we also bring other members along with us by the good works that we do, by the inspiration that we cause. Now, I mentioned unity. So there are a couple of things in those things about baptism that I mentioned. I mentioned unity, and I mentioned diversity. And those things come into play in baptism, uh, rather, Eucharist. Eucharist is the sacrament of unity. It's the booster shot if you will, after this COVID experience, the booster shot of the inoculation of baptism. St. Paul says, we eat from the one bread, 
We drink from the one cup and we become one in Christ. So there is unity in the fact that we receive the Eucharist. And when we say amen, when we come up, for, and that's so important, I, I, I say this over and over again, there is one thing that the church says you have to do before you receive communion. And some people do other things that they think are really important, but there's one thing that you have to do, and that is say amen. And sometimes I say the body of Christ, and I don't hear a word, and I say, say amen. And they're like, what, what, what? Amen, because amen means I believe this is the body of Christ, but it also says I w I'm willing to be become part of this mystical body. I'm willing to become part of that barrel. I am united with everybody here and with Christians throughout the world. I am willing to be united with them and to admit that what divides us is much less substantial than what unites us. So that amen is really important because it is an ascension, an agreement to what Jesus wants you to have happen to you when you receive the Eucharist. So say that. And sometimes I, I said this last weekend, I got people who went, I didn't hear anything. I read their lips. You know, you got to say amen. You got to really say that because this is really the most important thing that you do before you receive communion. So the Eucharist is a source and summit of unity. So a little bit of a story for you. Charles Drew went to medical school at McGill University in Montreal did further studies at Columbia University, one of the foremost scientists and medical people of his day, he developed an important technology, how to type blood and how to store blood. In World War I, many soldiers died, but they didn't die on the battlefield. They had lost blood. They were brought back to a mass unit and because they had lost blood and there was no way to give them blood, they were depleted. And all these sick men stuck together, there were infectious diseases. And those were the things that killed them. Not the initial bullet, not the initial bayonet strike, but the disease that followed. Because as a result of their depletion of blood, they didn't have the resistance to fight against the bacterial or viral infections that were rampant in these mass units. So they died. Drew wanted to find a way to solve this problem. So he typed blood, he stored blood, he even found a way to separate blood plasma from the whole parts of blood so that on the battlefield itself, they could get blood plasma to sustain them long enough to get back to the mass unit where they could get blood. After he did all that, he proved that he was not only a scientist, he was a mastermind of organization. He organized a group called Blood for Britain, and people all over England gave their blood for British soldiers. Then he came to the United States, where he was, which was his home, and he started the blood banks of the American Red Cross. He resigned in 1942. Why? Because he wasn't allowed to give blood. He was black. And no black soldiers could get blood, and no black civilians could give blood because there were laws in the books in both England and in the United States that said there should be no mixing of the blood between races. It was about marriage, but looking, looking at it literally, it meant no. You couldn't give white blood to a black person or black blood to a white person. Drew spent the rest of his life going around the country saying, this is not scientific, this is bigotry. There are people who are white who have O positive. There are people who are black who have O positive. Yes, in some cases, there is a preponderance of one more than another in terms of blood type, but really, there is no difference. All the blood types across the spectrum can be found in either black or white, and blood plasma is universal, regardless of what your color of skin, your country. It's just plasma. It's human. Now, in 1950, after spending eight years giving this message, he was on his way to the Tuskegee Institute, thank you, and he had a car crash. And there's some debate about what happened afterward, but the fact is that he died. He bled out. He wasn't given blood. 
Some people say he didn't stand a chance. His injuries were so bad that there was no way he could have been saved anyway. Other people say, well, at least they should have tried. They should have given him blood to see if that would save him. But the fact is that a man who made possible for so many soldiers in World War II to survive in those mass units because they were given blood plasma on the battlefield and then blood in the mass unit, the fact that he had saved so many lives, he himself, his life was not saved. His life was not even attempted to be saved. Now, I tell you that story because I think of the Eucharist as a blood bank, a blood bank that very often has to deal with this tension of segregation versus unity. In the book of Exodus, we read about how God says, I will be your father and you will be my people and you will obey my commandments and I will make you prosper if you agree to this deal. And Moses slaughtered a spotless lamb. And that spotless lamb was perfect. And so in some way it reflected the perfection of God But it was lamb, so it was a creature like we are. So in some ways, it reflected the createdness of humanity. That lamb was slaughtered, and half of its blood was put on the altar. That was God's half. And the other half was sprinkled on the people. That was our half. Now, if you're my age or before, older, before the age of age, you may remember when you were a kid, You became blood brothers or blood sisters. You pricked your finger and you mashed your finger against your friend's finger and you became blood brothers. It's kind of like that, but more serious. God adopted this people by sharing blood with them. The lamb's blood went to him and to the people and so they became blood kin. The problem is a lamb, even though it's spotless, is not God. And a lamb, even though it's not a creature, even though it's a creature, it's not a human being. So it was an imperfect fix. So Jesus comes to the world, the divine son of God, incarnate, a human being, fully human and fully divine. He is that blood bank. Unlike the spotless lamb, he is perfect because he is God, but he's also fully human, like us in all things but sin. And he dies on the cross And he gives us his body and his blood. And so, in a sense, every Eucharistic celebration is a chance to receive a transfusion of divinity into our humanity. Every Eucharistic celebration is a celebration of the fact that we are united with Jesus, who is God. So we are united with God. We are divinized. So we are given life. We're given fullness of life in this world and life eternal in the world to come as a result of this divine transfusion, as a result of this blood bank which we receive through Jesus. Sequoias, you see them in Sequoia National Park. They've lived more, they've lived 3,000 years, for goodness sakes. You wonder how they could do that with all the storms, you hear about the atmospheric river that's hitting California right now and the winds and the rains. How are the sequoias gonna live? And you might assume, well, their roots after two, 3,000 years are really deep. They're actually not. They're very shallow. So how do they survive? Those shallow roots reach out to the trees around them and the roots intertwine so that when the winds hit, they all lean together, but they're all able to come back to stability because there's strength in numbers. The sequoias have it right. They don't go deep, they go wide. They make sure that they are united with other trees and therefore they have strength. And I've said this many, many times, so forgive me if you've heard this, but the word for devil in Greek, or rather, let me go back. Jesus says, Whatever, whoever, is, does, whoever is not with me is against me, Whoever does not gather with me scatters. And the word scatter is diabolos, which we, from which we word, get the word devil. He divides and conquers. The word scatter comes from symbolos, symbol, sacrament. Gathering is Jesus' MO. 
Scattering is the devil's MO. Jesus wants us to gather. Therefore, we have strength against the devil because the gathering force is the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is the spiritual gravity that holds the Trinity together and holds us together as church. So it's important to have that unity from which we gather strength. And where does that unity come from? From the Eucharist. So there's a little quote I think I have here. Do I have it here? No, I don't think I do. So let me give it to you. I love this quote because I think it's kind of funny. It's from uh, the book of Ecclesiastes. Two are better than one because they have a good reward for their toil. For if they fall, one will lift up his fellow. But woe to him who is alone when he falls and has not another to lift him up. Again, if two lie together, they keep warm. But how can one keep warm alone? And though a man might prevail against one who is alone, two will withstand him. A threefold cord is not quickly broken. Now, Ecclesiastes says that. He's not thinking of marriage, but I think it's very appropriate for marriage. It's very appropriate for the family. It's also very appropriate for the Eucharistic community. We get together and we can withstand the temptations. We can withstand the evils. We can withstand the voices in the world that are telling us something that is not gospel-oriented because we are together. We correct one another. We enforce, reinforce one another's commitment to be for Christ. Another quote from uh, Lumen Gentium from Vatican II that I use often also. God does not make men holy and save them merely as individuals without bond or link between one another. Rather, it has pleased him to bring men together as one people, a people which acknowledges him in truth and serves him in holiness. It is the Eucharist that makes us into one people. It is the Eucharist that makes us strong that we are able to acknowledge him, that we are able to be holy. So the Eucharist makes that possible. Now, Eucharist as real presence and real food. My nephew, Brian, oh God, I think he's probably in his 50s now. When he was born, he was this fat little baby, very happy. But soon, only a matter of a couple of weeks after he was born, he started to have problems with indigestion. He would throw up, he would have diarrhea. And as the weeks progressed, that got worse and worse and worse. We entered into projectile vomiting and diarrhea that you couldn't believe. And instead of being a fat little baby, his stomach got distended like the pictures of children from plagued areas that are starving to death. And they tried everything to save him. And Nothing seemed to work. So finally, the doctors said to my brother, Darren, you know, we've tried everything and, and, and it's not working and it doesn't look good. And, you know, we just think that he's not going to make it. And so Darren and his wife, Beth, went off to a funeral home to make plans for a funeral. And meanwhile, there was a nurse, God bless her, who realized something that nobody else had realized. They had tried... Enfamil, they had tried baby food, they had tried canned peas, they had tried applesauce, all the things that you would think are soft that you could eat. But all of them came out of a can or a bottle. And she thought to herself, is there something about being canned or bottled that makes this child sick? And so she said to the doctor, could we just give him a soft boiled egg? They gave him the soft boiled egg and for the first time in like three weeks, he was able to eat it and not get sick. Turned out that Brian was allergic to sodium benzoate and EDTA, two of the most common preservatives in everything that we eat. So ever since then, Brian has had to shop at health food stores, but like me, unfortunately, he's done too well at, <laughs> at his consumption of food, so he probably should Watch out like I should as well. But Jesus says, my food, my body is real food, and my blood is real drink. What kind of things do we consume in our lives? You know, sex, drugs, and rock and roll. There are so many different voices that tell us what we should be consuming and what will really satisfy us, what will make us happy. 
what will make us complete, what will make other people like us, admire us. We hear those voices all the time on the TV, on the radio. The sexy woman draped across the front of a car. You buy this car, you'll be sexy too, you'll get that pretty lady. It's subliminal, but it does have an effect on what we think. And Jesus, when he says, I'm real food and I'm real drink, he's basically saying, you can't digest that other stuff. That other stuff is not going to make you full. That other stuff is not going to nourish you. That other stuff is just going to make you sick. Because little by little, if that's all you consume, as they say, as your mom told you, you are what you eat, you will become that. And that's not what my father created you to be. My father did not create you to be the model on the top of a car or the person who lusts off the model on the top of a car. My father created you for more than that. So stop consuming all that stuff that isn't going to help you and start to consume me instead. I'm real food. I'm real drink. If you hear, see on your, on your uh, outline here, Jesus said to them, Amen, amen, I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you do not have life within you. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him on the last day. For my flesh is true food, and my blood is true drink. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood remains in me, and I in them. Now, I have to admit, I have like three outlines here. I have one that I did for myself and one that I did for you and one that I outlined just this morning. So I don't know if this is on it. But there's another aspect I want to talk about, which is Eucharist as Thanksgiving. Is that on your outline? Okay. Oh, it's on the very beginning and I'm doing it at the end. I'm sorry. Okay. So here's a quote. The faithful should attend with devotion and full collaboration they should be instructed by God's word and be nourished at the table of the Lord's body. They should give thanks to God, offering the immaculate victim, not only through the hands of the priest, but also together with him. They should learn to offer themselves through Christ, the mediator. They should be drawn day by day into ever more perfect union with God and each other so that finally God may be all in all. I know a lot of you have heard me say this before. The word Eucharist in Greek, in ancient biblical Greek, means thanksgiving. So that is the most important thing we do when we come to Mass. We give thanks. I know this is not on your outline. This is from Sacrosanctum Concilium, which is the document in Vatican II which revised the Mass. The church earnestly desires that all the faithful should be led to that full, conscious, and active participation in liturgical celebrations, which is demanded by the, by the very nature of the liturgy, and to which Christian people have a right and obligation by their baptism. Full, active, conscious participation, it's your right, it's your duty. That's why the Mass went from Latin into the vernacular all around the world. Because if you don't understand the language, how can you be full, active, and conscious? If you don't understand the language, you can't really be conscious, can you? So the language changed the vernacular so that you could have full participation. Now, I will tell you, and I hope you will take this well, even though it is a criticism. The cantor says what number the hymn is, the opening hymn, and I'm in the vestibule. I can't hear it in the vestibule. So I get a hymnal, and I'm processing along the line, and I'm wondering, what is the hymn number? And I look, who has a hymnal? Nobody has a hymnal open. Not only are people not singing, they didn't even bother to pick up the book. That's not full active conscious participation. The whole point of all of the things that happened in Vatican II was to get you to participate. It's not a sport where you look on the sidelines and watch it's something where you are on the playing field. So full, active, conscious participation is your right, but it's also your obligation. You don't fulfill your Sunday obligation by coming and sitting in the pew and taking up space. You fulfill your obligation by being there and participating. And the way you participate is, as I said earlier, by giving thanksgiving. Jerry Austin, 
priest who is a Dominican. He's still alive, but he's very old now. He is one of the foremost liturgists in the United States in the 20th century. He was the theological chief, the head of Catholic University of America for many, many years. When he retired, he came down here and he taught at the Rice School, which we had, which was a wonderful school, and I had the privilege of teaching with him. And he would get up and he would, with a little bit of humor, say, I have a, a heavy theological term to give you. And everybody would look thinking, oh my God, it's going to be Greek or Latin. And he said, the word is plop, P-L-O-P. When you come to Mass and the bread and the wine are brought in during the offertory perception, procession, you have to plop on the altar your thanksgiving. What are you grateful for this week? Plop it on the altar. What are the challenges that are coming into your life in the coming week? Plop that on the altar. Because along with the bread and the wine, that gets consecrated too. All of that gets consecrated. If you are not participating, if you are not giving thanks for what happened and sharing your anxieties for what are to come, well, that, that's not on the altar then. So why be there? Plop all that stuff on the altar. Do your homework beforehand and say, what am I going to plop on the altar this Sunday? What am I grateful for? And what am I afraid of? And plop all that on the altar and ask God to consecrate it along with the bread and wine so that it becomes holy, that it's part of that mystical transformation of bread and wine into the body and blood of Christ. Okay, let me see here. Where am I? Okay. So I think on your on your on your on your uh, outline is there Eucharist as challenge and empowerment for service. Okay, good, good. I got something right. <laughs> so I'll read it because you don't have a, a mic. Here's a quote. After this, Jesus went across the Sea of Galilee. A large crowd followed him because they saw the signs he was performing on the sick. Jesus went up the mountain, and there he sat down with his disciples. The Jewish feast of Passover was near. When Jesus raised his eyes and saw that a large crowd was coming to him, he said to Philip, where can we buy enough food for them to eat? He said this to test them, because he himself knew what he was going to do. Philip answered him, 200 days wages worth of food would not be enough for each of them to have a little bit. One of his disciples, Andrew, the brother of Simon Peter, said to him, There is a boy here who has five barley loaves and two fish, but what good are these for so many? Jesus said, Have the people recline. Now there was a great deal of grass on that place, so the men reclined, about 5,000 in number. Then Jesus took the loaves, gave thanks, and distributed them to those who were reclining, and also as much as they wanted. When they had had their fill, he said to his disciples, gather the fragments left over so that nothing will be wasted. So they collected them and filled 12 wicker baskets with fragments from the five loaves that had been more than they could eat. Check my time. Okay. Now, here is a little bit of a controversy. There are a lot of scripture scholars who disagree on what this means. And the reason, part of the reason is because about 400 years ago, when the Bible started to get printed, the printers would read the scripture and divide it up and put verses. We didn't have chapters and verses before the printers. They put chapters and verses, and they put headings over each section. And the most common heading for this became the multiplication of the loaves. So everybody thought, okay, Jesus multiplied the loaves, that's what the editor said. And that may be the case, that it was that. But scholars say, wait a second, let's not just jump on to the editorial bandwagon and believe what the editors are saying, let's look at this. So they look and they see a group of people who are out in the middle of the desert. There's no Publix, there's no Piggly Wiggly you're not going to be able to go to some convenience store and buy a sandwich or get a Coke. They knew that. So they had to come with something to eat because they had to be prepared. This was common sense. Whenever they went out into the desert, into a deserted place, 
they came prepared. But when the apostles asked them, oh, I don't have anything. Sorry, bud, got nothing. But there is this one boy who has five barley loaves and two fish. Is it that he thought more than the adults? Or is it that he's too naive to say, gee, bud, I don't have anything, sorry. So Jesus says a prayer over these five loaves and two fish, and they are distributed among the people. And when everybody has had their fill, there's more food than when it started. So maybe Jesus did multiply the loaves. I have to say that I kind of have a preference for another opinion, which is also an opinion that a lot of scripture scholars have, but you may not feel comfortable with it because you may not have heard it. And that is, these folks knew that they were going to be hungry and brought food, and they thought to themselves, you know, maybe during intermission when Jesus is not saying anything, I'll go and hide behind a rock, and I'll eat my lunch, and no one will be the wiser. It's under the cloak. You know, they're in the desert. There's a big, heavy cloak that they got on. Nobody can see that they have food. And they're thinking, you know, why would I want to give the food away? Because there may not be enough for all of us. They're afraid of scarcity, and as a result of that fear of scarcity, they won't give. Jesus says a prayer, and somehow that prayer transforms their hearts. It gives them the courage and the feeling of generosity to be able to say, yeah, I can give. And so they eat what they need to eat, but then they put the rest in the basket. And by the time the basket has gone all the way around, there's more food in it than started. I'll tell you why I like that explanation better. Because multiplying the loaves is like a kind of magic trick, pulling a rabbit out of a hat. When the meal is done, the people are not changed. But if Jesus said a prayer that changed their hearts, that gave them a fresh perspective, that gave them new courage and new generosity, long after that meal is over, they will still have that transformation in their hearts. And that's why I like that explanation better. I don't know which one is true. I'm not telling you one is better than the other. I'm just telling you those are the two interpretations. But I like that because I think that prefigures what the Eucharist does in terms of if we are united and if we are giving thanks and grateful for what we have received, why wouldn't we want to be generous? Why wouldn't we want to give what we have been given? Why wouldn't we be brave enough to recognize in our unity, my brother, my sister needs help. And I'm grateful for what I've been given, so I want to help. So I think it's very Eucharistic to see it as a multiplication of hearts, of generosity and courage in hearts, more than a, a multiplication of loaves. But you believe what you, whatever you want to believe. I'm not trying to tell you one way or the other. Just two different opinions. Why did Jesus pick bread and wine for the Eucharist? The bread that he picked was unleavened bread because it was during the Passover. So it's kind of like pita bread. Now, in Jewish law, there were no forks and knives because whatever you put in your mouth had to stay in your mouth because if you took it out of your mouth, it was already defiled by being in your mouth so you couldn't put it, put it in your mouth a second time. So you couldn't use a fork, keep on putting it in your mouth. Whatever you put in your mouth stayed in your mouth. So what did they do? They tore off a piece of pita bread and they picked up a morsel of a meat or vegetable and they put that along with the pita bread in their mouth. So the pita bread was the means by which all the other good stuff got in their mouth. There was no fork, there was no knife, there was no spoon, there was the pita bread which gave you the rest of the food. So when Jesus says, I am the bread of life, he is saying, I am that by which you receive life. I'm that by which you grasp on to life. I'm the thing that gets you all the good stuff that you want to consume. Life and love and meaning and purpose and destiny and holiness. I am the means by which you get all those things because without me, you can't get it into you. But I'm that pita bread that allows you to grab on to all those good things and receive them. 
What about wine? They didn't have water treatment plants. All the water had lots of creepy crawlies in it. And so from infancy, as soon as a child stopped nursing, they always got water that was half wine because the alcohol content in the wine killed all the creepy crawlies and parasites in the water and made the water safe to drink. So when Jesus says, I am the wine of salvation, he's saying, I am that by which your life becomes safe. I am that by which you can travel this journey and be assured that your destiny is one of glory, not of calamity. So when he picked bread and wine, you know, for us, it's not clear. For the ancients, it was crystal clear. Bread, the thing which, with which I get all the other food. Wine, the thing that makes everything that I drink safe. He's giving me everything that I need, and he's giving me it in a way that I will always be safe. I have an insurance policy because Jesus has died on the cross and given me his blood, which is this consecrated wine. It was no accident that Jesus pick bread and wine. It's no accident that we don't receive lobster thermidor from the altar. We receive these things because they spoke loudly to the ancients, and we lose that sometimes, but let us now become aware of that and let it speak loudly to us when the bread and the wine are consecrated. And finally, Jesus in the Eucharist as a longing for heaven. John Todd was born in 1801 in Vermont. And when he was only seven years old, both his mom and his dad died in a carriage accident. And he and his two brothers and sisters were divided up among various relatives to be raised. And he was raised by his aunt Mabel, who proved to be a great mentor for him. She was a surrogate mother, great, saw him through college, paid for him to go to Yale Law School, gave him money to be established as an attorney in what was back then the Wild West of Chicago. And years later, he got a letter from her. And in that letter, she told him that the doctor said she had cancer and there was nothing that could be done. And she said, you know, I'm a woman of faith. I taught you faith myself. I really believe, but I'm still scared. Because I don't know when it will happen and what it will feel like. I trust that there is a heaven, but what happens before I get there scares me. And then he quotes from the Gospel of John. Do not let your hearts be troubled. You have faith in God. Have faith also in me. In my Father's house there are many dwelling places. If there were not, would I have told you that I am going to prepare a place for you? And if I do go and prepare a place for you, I will take you to myself so that where I am, you also may be. Where I am going, you know the way. Thomas said to him, Master, we don't know where you're going. How can we know the way? And Jesus answered him, I am the way and the truth and the life. Now, he quoted that because Jesus says, don't let your hearts be troubled. I am going to prepare a place for you. And he says to his aunt in his letter, even now, Jesus is preparing a place for you. And you may find that Jesus is so busy preparing a place that he will send a servant of death to bring you to your new home. But he will be there to usher you into glory. And then he reminds her, when I got off that horse to your house, and the very first time I ever saw you, you ushered me into your living room. And I saw right away why you hadn't come yourself. Because even though I was only seven, I could see you had been busy. Because there were cakes and pies and cookies and brownies and all sorts of junk food that kids only usually get in small doses. But you told me this was dinner. And you let me eat my fill of all my favorite foods. Jesus is preparing a place for you. And in that place you will find a banquet table, very much like that table you prepared for me. And on that banquet table, you will find all the people that you love, all the people that you miss, and you will find God presiding at the head of the table, making all of that possible. When we receive Eucharist from that altar, we are thinking about that table. Because in the early church, there was no 
stylized altar. It was a banquet table, and we all gathered around it, and we all thought about who would be there when our time came to leave this world and to come to the next. And they all knew that that Eucharist that they were receiving was the key to them leaving this world and to coming into glory. And so the Eucharist truly is the promise of salvation, the promise of being with those we love, the promise that this is not the end, but just the beginning. The Eucharist, which gives us everything as that pita bread, the Eucharist, which gives us safety in the wine consecrated, is the same Eucharist that promises that the good things and the safety we receive in this life do not end with death, but that we will once again be together in the Lord in heaven. That's it. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Oh, thanks. Okay. Anybody got any questions or anything? Nope? Okay, thank you very much. that's a bit of a distraction, just make sure you say amen, because it's not about your relationship with that person. 
Yeah, so just just focus not on them, focus on the Eucharist and say amen and think about what you're receiving and don't, you know, you don't need to say that. Yeah. Well, that, you know, that's true, but, but, but they're there because they want you to be able to receive the Eucharist and they want you to be aware of what you're receiving. And God bless you, it's kind of a distraction from that. Just make sure you're really conscious of what you're receiving. <laughs>